where you are in the world. Today, I'm going to start with something a little bit different. I'm going to start off with a question. Then we'll get back to the today's show after that question. The reason I'm starting with it is because I don't remember this ever coming up in the show. And the reality is it's a very important topic. Linda Buckner, curious to know how often you see reactive hypoglycemia. Undiagnosed for seven years, lows in the 30s, saw Dr. Rayner for the first time and A1C was 5.7, officially pre-diabetic. So it's a really good point. <clears throat> you know, I think one of the major concerns is that most docs uh, tend to not believe it. They tend to not think that it exists. That's this the standard belief system and spiel among docs. And guess what? If you don't believe something exists, you're not going to see it very often. It's unfortunate. Um, I wish a lot more doctors would just do an OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test. In other words, you know that test where you fast for about eight hours, then you get a blood glucose test, then you drink that syrup, that what we're doing is challenging your ability to metabolize carbs. And then we watch your glucose over the next couple of hours. Well, you know, just a few months ago, I got a panic, um, a panic value from the lab. They called Michelle. Michelle texted me, called me, and it was a patient that was getting one of these tests and the uh, blood sugar had come back at 26. You know, they call it a panic, but think about it. These blood sugars are not tested until days later. So if anything was going to happen to the patient, it would have happened then when the blood sugar tanked, not days later. So, you know, that's just a comment about silly things that don't make sense. There's no need to panic a week, a week or two later. But I called the patient anyway, immediately, and, and asked her about what was going on. She said, yeah, you know, I've had a little bit of that before. And I said, you know, that's a really low number. It might not have been truly that low, but no matter which way you look at it, it was still low. She, she said, yeah, I felt kind of woozy, a little bit hyper. But, you know, I feel that way every time I uh, eat something that I know has got carbs in it. So... <clears throat> How often do I see that? Uh, so the first comment is, yes, reactive hypoglycemia does exist, despite what your doctor may think. Uh, the other thing is, so if it does exist, you know, it's also the comment about why it's not diagnosed very often, because docs don't believe in it, and then they don't look for it. Then the next question is, how often do you see it? You don't really see it that often. I would say maybe uh, certainly less than 10% of the patients that I see have it. Now, the next question that you bring up or the next point you bring up is my uh, A1C was 5.7. So I'm uh, pre-diabetic. Well, so... What does that mean? Actually, it makes sense. All of the people that I've that I see with reactive hypoglycemia do show some significant prediabetes. I haven't seen anybody with full diabetes, but my, all of them I've seen have prediabetes. Now, here's another uh, just dot to connect. This is an endocrine issue, obviously. Let's look at uh, other endocrine issues. Uh, like thyroid, thyroid, hyperthyro uh, hypo or low thyroid disease is always preceded, uh, not always, almost always preceded by hyperthyroid. What happens is you get inflammation of the thyroid gland. It starts overreacting, over uh, producing thyroid hormone. You, you get hyperthyroid, and then that thyroid uh, inflammation burns out the function of the thyroid. And so it starts off as hyperthyroid and then goes to hypothyroid. Now, why did I go down that bunny hole? Because for some of us, those people that have reactive hypoglycemia in the beginning of their 
uh, journey into insulin resistance, they're following that same endocrine pattern that you almost always see with thyroid. And that is you get overactivity of the endocrine function of the pancreas. It gets challenged a little bit with uh, glucose and it just overreacts, overcompensates. And instead of bringing your blood sugar down to between 80 and 100, where it should be, it again, like we saw, we've seen, and I, we discussed in that example, down to 26 in some people. It, it, that's an unusual level of, of reactive hypoglycemia. Your routine garden variety reactive hypoglycemia happens more like, uh, goes to like, 70s and 60s and quite often like the patient that was in her 20s and didn't pass out she felt a little bit woozy you know she clearly was her body was clearly used to functioning in a low glucose state or she would have just passed out i mean some people would seize and die at those levels so Again, it makes sense from an endocrine perspective. Um, it used to be a popular diagnosis. Uh, and then docs quit. You know, I think when uh, one of the problems was when docs quit doing uh, OGTTs, maybe they forgot some things like the existence of reactive hypoglycemia. So that's uh, the discussion about reactive hypoglycemia. I wanted to go ahead and get started with that Q&A. We're going to go back now and do and start like we usually do for the show. Now, what is the show? What do we do? We, we basically are helping people. We create content which helps people. Uh, m many people would say is boring. Many people would say it's unimportant. But here's the thing. This is the number. This one item kills and disables more people than anything else and hold on just a second i'm having a technology issue here trying to get this uh gilbert are you able to get that uh question that answer off of the slide for me well gilbert i'm gonna see if you can try to do that while i am Hmm, it's just not showing up right. Okay, anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with the, the show, the normal content. So our content is helping folks understand what causes the most death and disability in our world today. And guess what? It's something that's very common. The vast majority of us are going to get into it if we live to be past age 30, 40, 50. In fact, the uh, people love to hate on the government, love to hate on the CDC. The CDC has been saying for a long time that two thirds of us have this problem by the time we're age 60. Newer information indicates that oh, it's not two thirds uh, and it's not age 60 anyway, it's age 30. By the time we're age 30, one half of us have prediabetes. By the time we're age 60, it's a lot more. By the time we're, it's the vast majority of us. So <clears throat> this channel is helping us understand the most common causes of death and disability. If you've, uh, if you've not seen our content, we cover this, these issues go way deep. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about new frontiers in diabetes and weight loss. There are some big changes happening in this space right now. Uh, previous topics, uh, homocysteine and methylation. You may have heard the term methylators. Uh, Z-Dog, MD, he's a popular... Uh, satirist and uh, f physician uh, content creator. He says that, yeah, methylators do exist. MTHFR does exist, but it's totally uh, inconsequential. There's absolutely nothing of any significance with that. Well, Z-Dog is a, he's a, an intensivist. He's, you know, he goes in to basically spend his day in the ICU. By the time you get in the ICU, yep, 
poor methylation is not really an issue anymore. It is, he is right in his world. But when you go back into the world of prevention, keeping us out of the ICU, keeping us from having a heart attack, methylation is a big deal. So we talk about that. Uh, there's content on it from last week. We uh, covered, we, we love to have folks that are actually out in the real world living this life and finding that the content that we're creating is very helpful. Daniel Trevor is a super senior. He, uh, he was an actor. He was, uh, he owns a company in the skincare business. So he was doing great in terms of keeping the outside of himself looking good. His biggest regret is um, he had not seen the content of this channel until he had a heart attack. And he said, you know what? I wish I'd known how to keep the inside of me looking good instead of just the outside. So he gives his, his story a couple of weeks ago. Cardiovascular prevention from a cardiac surgeon's perspective. So uh, Dr. Philip Avedia is a, an Ivy League trained thoracic surgeon, heart surgeon. He had his own problem with obesity and cardiovascular risk, and he shares on the channel, you know what? Uh, despite doing that for a living, I was totally uh, misdirected, misguided. And surgery is not the answer. And in fact, has redirected some of his career to doing something similar to what I do. Prevention on a YouTube channel. And prevention on, uh, he's, he's not got a YouTube channel. He's got uh, a, um, a telemedicine practice. So again, uh, Phil, by the way, has written a book. It's a bestseller. It's Stay Off of My Operating Table. And it's the real reason that, uh, that he's in his career at this point in time. He's, he's changed the focus from surgery, cleanup, to prevention. So how do you deal with this? Um, you don't go to your, you could go to your doctor, but here's the problem with, with depending on our primary care doctors. Groups like Harvard, uh, Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, uh, some of the basic purveyors of standard medical research have all begun to acknowledge and agree. It's very unfortunate that here in the United, <clears throat> here in the United States, the uh, supposedly the purveyors of the best medicine in the world, maybe not, but at least the largest manpower group of the best trained docs are the most highly trained, maybe not the best. Pro well, absolutely not the best because two thirds of those primary care docs don't know how to diagnose this problem, let alone how to deal with it. So uh, that's, again, the purpose of this channel, the purpose of our content. And so we've created a, a basic core content. Uh, there are three areas which your typical primary care doc just doesn't understand. For example, how to evaluate plaque. It's not, hey, doc, uh, my, my brother had a heart attack. Why don't we get a stress test? Stress tests are not the way to go. And we talk about how to evaluate plaque. Again, it's not how your doc's used to doing it. It's not what you assume. Uh, insulin resistance, as, as we mentioned, is the cause. Whether it's full-blown diabetes or prediabetes, it's the same disease, and it's a disease process, and it is what's killing us and disabling us. Most docs don't understand that. With just a couple of hours and this free course, you can understand it better than 90% of docs. Cardiovascular inflammation is another issue. It, it adds a little bit of uh, urgency to the, to the equation. Again, even if you think most docs don't understand insulin resistance, you should check into the physician understanding of cardiovascular inflammation. And again, within just a couple of hours and minimal financial investment, you can get there and know more than your doc. And guess what? Live a longer, healthier life. Uh, because of the continuing demand for our content, um, we've been asked to develop other uh, ways to access it. Uh, there's, there are memberships. 
uh, available now on YouTube. There are uh, locals memberships and, uh, and subscriptions to uh, Rumble. We still have the monthly subscription plan. And <clears throat> one thing we, you need to be aware of is we are working hard right now. It's probably going to take us another couple of months but over the next two to four weeks, I expect us to start doing a pilot project where we accept Medicare. Medicare is well known among doctors in the U.S. as being a very, very low paying insurance. But here's part of the issue, and it's something to be aware of. It was, what, 15, 20 years ago when they started talking in the United States about Medicare may go bankrupt. Well, uh, Medicare is... For those of you not in the United States and that don't understand it, it is a universal health care uh, insurance product supported by the United States government. It basically pays for anybody age 65 and older. Now, <clears throat> as Medicare began to react to that, and, and as you can see, the federal government uh, in the United States is really going to have problems giving up Medicare. You know, there's a lot of people. The, uh, the gray tigers, uh, 65 year, years and older, who are voting. And they, we, I'm now one of them, we depend on Medicare for a major benefit. So it's going to be a big surprise to see Medicare actually uh, go away. I don't expect that until and unless the actual federal government goes away. But here, but you are seeing significant changes. And here's what happens. So, you know, people pay, people do what they get paid to do. And originally, uh, 20 years ago, and you still see a lot of it today, it's still the most common way of paying insurance. It's called fee for service. You pay a doctor, for example, for doing something where you know something was done. And for a doctor to say, well, I'm educating a patient, mm, well, you don't know that that was done. So it's hard to pay for that. So you pay for things like prescriptions and not time educating or talking to a patient or teaching a patient that what I do doesn't matter so much as what you do. You can't, I cannot out prescribe your lifestyle problem. So if you're, if Medicare is only paying, if insurance is only paying the doctor to write a prescriptions, guess what happens? You get a process where your typical doc goes in, starts looking through the chart. What's a prescription I can write this patient? writes the prescription, you know, how are you doing? How's Uncle Joe? Um, what can I do for you today? Oh, okay, let me write this script. And then the average doc is out of the room in seven minutes. That's not good medical care, but it's what's happened. It's what happens when insurance pays fee for service. So let's fast forward. So again, a couple of decades ago, they started saying, well, Medicare may go bankrupt. Well, Medicare started realizing that they were having problems. They started doing experiments with what they call fee for value, helping people stay out of the hospital. That's not easy. That's very difficult. That's prevention. That's what we do. And it has a lot more to do with coaching and teaching and being available to provide information for patients and for motivating patients, for engaging patients in dealing with their own health decisions, what primarily what and how much they eat every day, but also things like exercise and sleep. So actually Medicare for the past 20 years has begun making progress. Now, Here's what's happened in terms of delivery of health care. Medicare has actually decreased a lot of their fee for service, uh, their standard fee for service uh, compensation to doctors by up to 20 to 30 percent. Now let's switch hats and talk about business. Those of you who own or run a business or have any uh, experience in accounting realize that, you know what? Businessmen, your first, your first 60, 70, sometimes even 90 percent of your the income dollars that your business brings in goes to pay for your expenses. And your typical doctor is not a great business person. Um, typically, 70 percent, 80 percent of 
compensation that your typical doctor gets goes to pay that front office staff, goes to pay for rent, goes to pay for nursing support. And the doctor's living off of that final 20 or 30 percent. What happens if you only know how to do um, fee for service and now your payers are decreasing that by 30 percent? Suddenly you're paying your staff, but you're not paying yourself. And we see that over and over and over again. Now, why don't the docs just switch to fee for value, actually helping keep people out of the hospital, helping people understand that I can't out prescribe your lifestyle challenges because that's difficult. That takes a totally different way of, doing medicine. And guess what has happened? In those past 20 years, docs have just, their reaction to this decrease in fee for service is write more scripts, see more patients, push people through harder. And that's why you saw what we saw when we went to Alabama. Um, if you had a second question, a second symptom, you got the hand. Hey, I, don't, I can only deal with one today. You'll have to set up an appointment, wreck your day, come back in, and you'll get seven more minutes on your next problem. We don't deal with more than one problem in a day. That's called churn, and that's what happens when you do fee-for-service, and then you start backing off on your fee-for-service payments, and the people that are doing these services don't know how to do anything but that. So we're beginning to change that. Uh, Medicare is actually beginning to uh, compensate more appropriately. It's, it's not great, but it's more appropriately in the fee-for-value education system. They're doing things like CCM, chronic uh, care management. And we're getting in the business of, uh, number one, uh, doing that ourselves in more of a Medicare uh, type of environment. And number two, helping other docs learn how to do that. So there's big changes afoot in terms of how healthcare is delivered. And we are being a part, a big part of that change. And you can be a big part of that change too, in terms of helping us deliver healthcare better. So take the survey and uh, thanks for, uh, for your interest in that issue. You know, I mentioned a few minutes ago that when you have, you want to evaluate your risk for heart attack and stroke, a stress test is not the way to go. Guess who's the poster boy for that? Big Russ, Tim Russert. He started having some problems with his risk. He started, you know, his waist size started getting up to about 39. He was coughing with his ACE inhibitors like I often did. I've switched now to ARBs, by the way, for those of you who listen and are interested. Because of that issue, I uh, had uh, some recurring uh, upper respiratory issues associated with a COVID infection that I had at one point. Anyhow, I'm going to stop that bunny hole and go back to this. Tim Russert uh, passed his uh, stress test with flying colors because he's a runner or he was a runner. Six weeks later, he had a heart attack and died, even though his stress test was normal. So if you think getting a stress test is going to and passing a stress test is going to assure that you don't have a heart attack, please think again. Please get the book. Please get the content. Please learn a little bit more than your doctor's going to tell you. Now, short form uh, comment about uh, a GLP-1 agonist losing its patent. You know, I, I've been talking a lot about GLP-1 since the new, new, I call them, quote, new, air quotes, new, they're really not that new. These, these medications came out, uh, gosh, a little bit over a decade ago. 13 years is the standard for patents for medications. And one of the GLP ones is losing its patent next year. Novo Nordisk's GLP-1 Blockbuster Victoza. It was originally coming out for both weight loss and diabetes. Liraglutide or liraglutide. Most people call it liraglutide. Um, the patent's expiring. Sandoz is licensed to launch a generic version uh, as of June 24, uh, June 2024, or perhaps even sooner. 
other competitors, Teva, Viatris, Myelin, Pfizer, they have versions. And as always happens when you get big, big medications approaching patent loss, you start getting a lot of litigation because it's cheaper to hire lawyers and litigate over this stuff than it is to lose your access to the ability to sell drugs if you are big pharma. We all love to hate on big pharma or a whole lot of us do. Um, speaking of big pharma, we'll cover some other big pharma issues in the, uh, the major program for today. And that's on the new frontiers in diabetes and weight loss. So if you'll give us the water ball, we'll get to that. New frontiers in treatments of diabetes. Yes, this is a new frontier. And if you've been watching the channel a lot, you've heard me talk about this. Again, this is the biggest thing happening in our space in over a decade, maybe forever. We are getting access to some tools which make a huge, huge difference. And those, uh, those tools, those medications, if you do what I do, and you get a, see a lot of people with heart attack and stroke risk, plaque, you know that over 80%, you know, Brad and Amy in their book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene, say it's 75%. I think they're wrong. I think it's 85, at least over 80% of heart attack and stroke risk is caused by this issue. And if you do what I do in terms of bringing patients in and getting oral glucose tolerance tests, insulin surveys, you also have no doubt in terms of saying, yep, uh, aging may be the number one driver of this issue. Genetics may be a, a top three driver. But guess what? You really can't do anything about aging and genetics. There is one of those top three drivers of this problem, though, that you can do something about. It's the difference between muscle and body fat, that ratio in your body. You see, we used to think that, you know, muscle was really cosmetic and performance, physical performance oriented. We did not know that muscle actually protects you from this problem. It's becoming clearer and clearer that it does. The other thing that we didn't know was that body fat well, you'll hear them list uh, the cells listed as adipocytes. Adipose means fat, site means cells. Well, I'll alert you when we use that term a little bit later. But body fat, we used to think body fat was an inert, harmless energy storage tissue that maybe just didn't look great to a lot of people. Mm -mm. That's become very clear over the past 10 years that uh, insulin resistance, this thing, this underlying disease process that causes the, the vast majority of death and disability is actually driven by fat cells. They release things called cytokines. They release some hormonal uh, components that actually make our insulin receptors not respond to insulin. And that is what we call insulin resistance, which is also known as prediabetes and diabetes, which are also known as the number one cause of heart attack, stroke, dementia, blindness, and kidney disease. So let's go to the topic itself. Go to the, the script. GLP-1 agonists, that's ozempic, semaglutide, liraglutide, the thing that we mentioned a few minutes ago is actually one of them losing its patent. See, the big issue with these are they are still incredibly expensive, but you're starting to see some movement in that area as one of the big ones starts to lose its patent. Glip on agonists and terzepatide. Now, why do we list terzepatide differently? And what is terzepatide? You may remember we covered that a couple of months ago. It's the twincretin, 
What is a twin cretin? We'll get there in just a minute. But it's that new drug called Monjero, which was just far more effective than even Ozempic in terms of both weight loss and management of diabetes. Now, let's go into the science and back to the script. Glucagon-like peptides. You know, you hear me use this term over and over again, GLP-1. That stands for glucagon-like peptide. Peptide is a, is a protein. These things stimulate pancreatic insulin secretion and they stop hunger. How do they do that? So these <clears throat> peptides are actually released. They're an incretin. That's something that we knew back in, you know, I even learned it in medical school, a little bit of comment about it 30 something years ago, over 30 years ago. But then we just learned about it and there was no practical significance. So the medical community actually just ignored incretins. Well, it's turning out that incretins are incredibly important. What are they? They are a hormone, but they're not released by a typical hormone gland. You know, we talked about hormones a minute ago with thyroid. The thyroid gland is a hormone. Parathyroid, parathyroid gland is a hormone. The pancreas has, is a gland. It, it, the islets of Langerhans, the parts that secrete insulin are a gland. But this doesn't come from that kind of gland. It comes from the small intestine. What the small intestine's doing is it's saying, look, we are, um, we're digesting food here. And when the small intestine is digesting food, it starts re releasing this incretin. What does that incretin do? As it says here, it stimulates the pancreas to increase, uh, to secrete insulin because it's saying, look, we're getting ready to dump food and sugar into the bloodstream. So the pancreas, you need to start uh, secreting insulin. But there's something else it does. It sends a message to the stomach and says, we're busy down here. Don't release and dump more food in, uh, for us to deal with because we can't deal with it. That, <coughs> that is what stops the hunger. This, it tells the stomach, mm, don't, uh, don't, uh, released to us and therefore the stomach says, well, I'm not taking, uh, taking new stuff. I'm full. And those of us that have taken uh, Ozempic and these other glip ones really go from a transition to where many of us wake up hungry every day to where we wake up and it's like, hmm, not so hungry anymore. I've got to actually feel full. And we'll talk a little bit more about physiologically what's happening there in a few minutes. So back to the script, semaglutide, which is ozempic, ribelsis is the oral version. Um, Wygovi is the version that's used for just simply weight loss, but they're all semaglutide. Exenatide, I think it was one of the first ones. And unless I'm mistaken, it might, have, it might be the one that actually came from, th these were discovered originally uh, as a part of the saliva of a Gila monster. I, I know that may sound totally weird, but look it up. Exenatide, saliva of Gila monsters. Uh, Dilaglutide or diloglutide, loraglutide, the one that we mentioned earlier that's losing its patent. Now, these are for the most part injectables, but as I've mentioned, there is a ribelsis is a, an oral version of semaglutide. Terzepatide, we mentioned that a minute ago and we covered it a couple of months ago. It's a dual glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. Wow. Uh, who would want to use those kind of words on a, on a public YouTube channel? Well, let's go back again with all these technical words, just break them down and they become much simpler. Dual means there's two mechanisms going on here. Glucose dependent. It means obviously it, it's, it doesn't tend to activate until there's glucose available. Insulin, we know what that is. Atropic means it, it, um, it mimics insulin or it uh, increases insulin. And a polypeptide is just a protein. So it's a protein that causes more release of insulin. And it's glucose dependent. That's all of that means. So it's a GIP, GIP, glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptides. GLIP is the glucose-like peptide. And so 
the terzepatide, the thing that's different about it is it has two similar uh, but different mechanisms. And so therefore it's known as a twin critin instead of an incretin. Just a little bit of a play on words there. Its effects include weight loss, huge weight loss, incredible weight loss. It was like the vast, what? We'll cover it in a few minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll hold on before I make that comment. It also causes insulin secretion. So the blood uh, average blood sugar goes down. The, the A1Cs drop. Uh, increased diuresis. What's diuresis? Uh, peeing. So you're because you're you don't have as high levels of glucose. You're uh, losing some of the osmotic pressure. You're therefore peeing a lot of the fluid out that you used to hold. It, this also decreases gastric emptying, like the first clip ones, and uh, increases cardioprotection. Now, I know. I'm getting a lot. I'll get a lot of just like, I mean, don't go on YouTube unless you've got thick skin. I know a lot of folks are going to say, hey, doc, drugs are not the way to go. I would agree. Uh, actually, we've actually we've had somebody come on, uh, Will Gillum, who had been taking one of these uh, medications for his diabetes for a couple of years, didn't lose a pound. So as good as these uh, tools are, these drugs are for weight loss as as uh, popular as they're becoming for weight loss, who hasn't seen a Wygovi ad? They still don't make you lose weight until you get involved in the process. So GLP-1's interaction with ghrelin and leptin. Well, you remember what ghrelin is? Maybe not. I did a couple of videos a long time ago. It is the hunger hormone. How about leptin? Leptin is the sort of the antithesis of ghrelin. Anyhow, let's get back to the script. We'll talk about it. This is from a Journal of Nutrition, 2015. Um, the, the research groups were in uh, the United States and France. It was a review article showing evidence that GLP-1s act regulating glucose metabolism and food intake. So people decrease their food intake and they also get better A1C levels. How does it do that? It acts on what's called vagoafferent neurons. Well, vans, what vagal, you know, that's the vagus nerve. You know, there's fight and flight, which gets you excited and up and going. But then there's slow down, recuperate, rest. That's where the vagal nerve comes in. It's a nerve that tells our gastrointestinal system to, uh, to digest. It tells our, um, our heart rate to slow down. That's how um, some of this decreased breathing rate slows down our heart rate and helps us go to sleep. It's because of stimulation of the vagal nerve. So let's go back. So uh, leptin can stimulate GLP-1 secretions in endocrine cells and in neurons. Ghrelin has the ability to suppress the anorexigenic. What does that mean? Anorexia, you know, loss decreased food intake, loss of weight. So GLP-1s can, our normal GLP-1s, the stuff that our intestines make, decreases our appetite. So when it, why does a teenager have, uh, why is a teenager skinny, even though they've, you know, they're burning a lot more calories than, an, than a middle-aged person? A lot of that's because they've got very active GLP-1 activities. Now, what does ghrelin do? Remember, ghrelin's the har hunger hormone. So ghrelin actually can overcome that GLP-1 activity. Now, this is the next, uh, a very interesting statement about what's going on here with the, the new drugs and the new tools. Unlike native or internal GLP-1s made by the intestines, synthetic GLP-1s don't get degraded by the body. They therefore decrease food intake through additional mechanisms. So that's actually how they work. Now, those of you who uh, follow uh, some of the discussions that I have and followed the uh, statement that uh, yes, I'm thin. I'm not interested so much in weight loss. I am interested in protecting myself from heart attack and stroke. And I was able to start take, I, I said to myself, you know, those are very expensive drugs. I can't wait till I get on Medicare and I'll try those. 
actually, I didn't have to wait till I got on Medicare. Um, the Ozempic people and some of the others, are, Trulicity folks, are starting to, again, market more heavily because one of their group, one of their competitors is headed towards um, loss of patent. So you're going to start seeing some marketing things like uh, leaving uh, samples. I was able to get samples in some of our clinics. The first thing that hit me was totally... I didn't expect to see that. I had not seen it with any patients and I didn't have a whole lot of patients on it because of the cost of these drugs, but I didn't expect to see it. I hadn't heard anything in the science about it. I slept walked again. And the last time I slept walked was when I was a teenager. What? I'm 65 now, 50 years ago. In other words, I began to really sleep better. Now, I haven't slept walk again since that first night about three or four months ago. So I have slept walked once out of the past 50 something years. And it was the second night after uh, taking Ozempic. But I have continued to sleep much, much better. There's just no question. And I, as I said, I, I became very curious. What is this thing about GLP-1s? insulin resistance, and sleep. So we began to look around. Uh, we found this uh, 2022 United States, California uh, research group, Institute of Neuroscience and Psychology. Does insufficient sleep increase the risk of developing insulin resistance? A systematic review. Well, in the end, it turns out that yes, it does. And there's a two-way spiral here. In, uh, insulin resistance decreases our ability to sleep. When we don't sleep well, that increases our insulin resistance. And I will tell you this, if I've seen it um, with one of my patients, I've seen it with hundreds of patients, this association between poor sleep and insulin resistance. There's a, yet another way that you start getting hooked into this, and that has in this spiral, this death spiral of poor sleep causing more insulin resistance, which in turn causes poor sleep. And that other association has to do with sleep apnea. But let me get back again to the script, and we'll talk about it. There were 10 studies included in this. This was a, a uh, as you know, meta-analysis, meaning looking at multiple studies on the same topic to see what you can glean extra out of the evidence. Sleep duration was significantly associated with insulin resistance, and that was a negative duration. Decreased, uh, increased insulin resistance, decreased sleep. Decreased sleep, increased insulin resistance. C-reactive protein, serum amyloid uh, A, SAA, glip ones Now, again, we're not talking about the, the medications. We're talking about the GLP-1 har natural hormone being made by the patient's or the subject, the study subject's intestine. They all played a key role. The increase of severe SOAS, sleep obstructive apnea syndrome, in other words, sleep apnea. Increased sleep apnea, decreased GLP-1 response to glucose tolerance. So let me repeat that. Increased sleep apnea, decreased sleep, decreased GLP-1 response. And so therefore that's, you know, we've talked about it before. We, those of us who've read the book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, you know, he makes the comment in there about they've done actual sleep studies and they find that if someone has poor sleep, they'll have increased insulin resistance the next couple of, uh, the next couple of days. You know, the obvious logic was, well, decreased sleep increases uh, cortisol. Yes, that's true. But when you actually go in and look at the studies on the biochemistry, the way these studies did, they found they didn't they didn't really talk about uh, cortisol, but they did look at glip ones made by the body and they found decreased secretion and responsiveness secretion of and responsiveness to glip ones. So again, maybe we're starting to begin to tease out. This is very recent 
research, like I said, it was this year. It looks like we're beginning to tease out this interesting and perhaps and very, very important association between sleep, sleep apnea, insulin resistance, you know, each causing the other and therefore taking us into that death spiral that results in blindness, kidney disease, heart attack, stroke, and death. Insulin resistance in adipocytes. I remember remember earlier on I talked about adipocytes and I said, you know, another one of those big clinical words. It's not don't be afraid of it. it it's simple. It's what the medical scientists are calling fat cells. Adipose means fat. Site means cell. So insulin resistance in fat cells disrupts, again, another chemical called NEFA. Bottom line is insulin resistance um, begets more insulin resistance in these fat cells. <clears throat> so how do you recover? Well, two nights of recovery sleep were still not enough to restore optimum glucose control. And those of us, again, we've covered it multiple times in discussions of the, the Matt Walker book, While We Sleep. This increased insulin resistance from poor sleep takes more than 48 hours to correct. So <clears throat> we've talked about that sleep connection, that sleep apnea connection with uh, GLP-1s. Let's talk about the other thing, the thing that's, you know... I, somebody sent me an article uh, recently and it was about the designer drug Ozempic and how anybody and everybody uh, that can afford it is complaining about it, criticizing other people's use of it. But they're also tending to get a little bit thinner. Um, <clears throat> there were 1900. Th uh, this is an article once weekly semaglutide in adults with overweight or obesity it was in the number one journal of medicine, unless you want to argue that nature medicine is bigger. It's not as well known. New England Journal, last year, United States, looking at Ozempic. 1961, non-diabetic subjects were enrolled in this study. Now, here's one of the questions that somebody like me and you should have. Well, how many of those folks were actually undiagnosed diabetics and how many of those were insulin resistant, but maybe not full diabetic. Uh, I suspect a large part of them, just knowing our statistics, by the time you're age 30, uh, over half of us have that. And we didn't talk about the, the age group, but this was more of a middle-aged group. Anyhow, uh, they compared 60 we 68 week treatment of semaglutide, Ozempic, Rob Elsus, uh, uh, Wagovi, or a placebo. And you're saying, again, Doc, you're focusing too much on drugs. Well, you, you know, they, and not enough on lifestyle. They did the same lifestyle intervention with both groups. The mean change in body weight from baseline was 15% or 14.9% in the semaglutide group as compared with 2.4% with placebo. So think about that. Um, you know, Ken Berry, all, you know, the other standards, the other standard bearers for let's do it naturally. And I've been one as well and remain one. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that I had an example of somebody who was taking these medications for two years and didn't lose weight. He really actually overcame something because the bottom line is this. You do with the same lifestyle changes, you get what? Six times the impact with the addition of semaglutide or Ozempic, Wagovi, Ribelsis. More participants in the semaglutide group achieve weight reduction of 5% or more. And obviously, guess who funded it? The group that makes it. And, um, you know, I know there there will be haters for that, just like there are haters for any other uh, facts that you report on uh, social media. Now, let's go back and talk about terzepatide. Uh, that's the one that we reported on uh, a couple of months ago. Again, it was even far more powerful than semaglutide. Also, New England Journal this year, 
uh, study groups in the United States, U, uh, UK, Canada, Japan, and Brazil. This was called the Sermont One trial. And remember, the medication is now called Monjero. 2,539 adults were included. Terzepatide, or Monjero, was given once weekly. It was compared to placebo for 72 weeks for weight loss. 85% of patients showed at least 5% body weight loss and 50% or 57% lost up to 20% of their body weight with terzepatide. So again, this is body weight along the vertical. This is um, what people lost with placebo. And yes, there were some lifestyle components. And this, <clears throat> this is what people lost with five milligrams of terzepatide. This is what they lost with 10, and this is what they lost with 15. So as you begin to look at the details on that, what would most uh, reasonable folks say? Well, you I mean you could use five milligrams. You do get an increased impact with 10, but you really don't get that much of an increase beyond the 10. Another terzepatide trial, another one on the, in the New England Journal. It was last year, 2021, United... Uh, United Kingdom, U UK, US, and Argentina. This time with 1,879 patients, terzepatide was compared uh, versus semaglutide for type 2 diabetes control. This wasn't spe more specifically to weight loss like the, uh, the Mont, uh, surmount trial was. This was more focused on diabetes control. After 40 weeks, terzepatide, pardon the the uh, anyhow, uh, terzepatide decreased hemoglobin A1C more effectively than sermaglutide. And yes, they did look at weight loss and it was significantly beyond what you saw with semaglutide or ozempic. So, yeah, uh, we covered a whole lot about drugs today. We covered about we covered drugs that have begun to be very popular in terms of their ability to help with weight loss. I expect to get a whole bunch of haters, hater comments on that. But the reality is the reality. These, uh, these drugs are saving lives. And again, if you were a physician like me and you were seeing people with heart attack and stroke risk, and you saw the impact of weight loss on or weight gain on insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, and you knew the impact of pre of prediabetes, insulin resistance, diabetes on heart attack and stroke, uh, cardiovascular risk. These things would make a heck of a lot of sense. Criticize it or not. So. <laughs> Uh, if you'll give us the transition, Gilbert, we'll go into the rest of Q&A today. So Q&A, we've got a lot of folks here, a lot of questions. We'll see what we can get through. As I mentioned, I covered that first question Reactive hypoglycemia. Yes, it is very common. No, you don't hear see the diagnosis, you don't see that diagnosis a lot because docs ignore it. Why do they ignore it? Because they're not doing OGTTs. If they started doing those again, they'd start seeing this again. ET himself stuck, can't lose weight as I could before. Very low carb intake and 12 to 18 hours fasting. I believe. What I will be doing next will work in a good morning. Well, the question is, what are you going to be doing next? Obviously, our body is really, really good. You know, when we're teenagers, our body seems to be good at losing weight, you know, between age 20 and maybe age 30 or 40. But in our 30s, many of us start losing the ability to lose weight. That seems to correlate with the time of life when many, when more of us start getting insulin resistant. Funny that that should happen, isn't it? So 
it's tough getting stuck. I see that all the time, hitting a plateau in terms of weight management. It takes something new to get to a new level. Uh, sort of things that we tend to see in terms of, or, or I've suggested in terms of new levels, uh, addition of HIIT training. A lot of people will do some resistance training and a little bit of aerobics. Uh, you don't need to jog or walking get, accomplishes most of what you need and it's far safer. But a lot of people don't want to do HIIT. HIIT training is a big deal and it can often be the thing that unlodges you to get beyond that next plateau. Another thing is very few people will do prolonged fasting. So like you, E.T. himself, uh, they'll, they'll do some uh, intermittent fasting or shrink that time uh, eating window. It's also called TRE, time restricted eating. Uh, but, and they'll drop carbs. You know, I, I see a lot of people that drop carbs, lose a lot of weight. I see a lot of people that drop carbs and then add time restricted uh, eating to it. Again, get a big improvement. But I don't see a whole lot of people that go to prolonged fasting. And that is fasting at like 24 hours or more. And I see even fewer people that do like a full seven day or five day fast. So these are all some things that can maybe get your body out of that, uh, out of the doldrums, out of that plateau and get you to the next level. And of course, as we've been discussing, discussing in this, in the content for today, there are medications now. Uh, as, uh, metformin has been a common way, a common uh, addition to lifestyle for weight loss for a lot of people. And as we discussed today, the new drugs are beginning to make a big, big impact. Now, let's go back up. We had a couple of other comments. Um, Jonathan Hull. Good morning, Dr. Brewer. Gilbert Aspen and the rest of the team. Mabu hi. I'm in Sacramento temporarily, returning to the Bay Area in November. Well, uh, both of them, beautiful areas. We, in one, one of my past careers, we did a roll-up. We started buying clinics throughout the country, um, in occupational medicine and uh, bought a series of clinics in the Bay area and then went out to Sacramento. Um, won't go any deeper in that comment other than to say, we'll talk about Mabuhai in a minute. Mabuhai, Mangandang Buhai. That's from Bobby Ocampo who lives in the Philippines. And here's what it means. Long life. Ma means some kind of long and Buhai means life. And then Mangandang means beautiful. Long life, beautiful life. Mabuhai, mangandang, buhai. So let's get to the next uh, comment. I'm up, Bobby, again, from the Philippines. Exercise in a fasted state. Oh, that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up, Bobby. Uh, that, you know, anything that's... It's like uh, you stress versus distress. Uh, for those of you that can start getting into exercising in a fasted state, that creates yet a little bit more of that metabolic stress that our body tends to respond well to. 30 minutes of exercise puts you in autophagy, autophagy from the diet doctor. And autophagy for some of you might be one of those, wait a minute, that's a big word, auto meaning like the self and phagy meaning to eat. So basically it's this, the recycling by your cells. They're eating old beat up non-functional mitochondria and other things that uh, need to happen. So it does stimulate autophagy and diet doctor is a great content creator. Melissa Swine. Oh, Melissa became a YouTube member. Thank you so much, Melissa. We appreciate it. Those of you who do that, as you can see, um, Gilbert, if you could get the, uh, the banner up, I'd appreciate it. Members um, are helping us support uh, things like Gilbert's salary, the salary for other folks. And again, um, we're doing a little offshore uh, uh financial arbitrage. So we've got really good, talented people in other countries like the Philippines, like Gilbert, like Aspen. Um, 
And just minimal contributions can help us improve the quality like Gilbert's helping us do today. Old Roscoe dance music. <laughs> yes, I was wondering if I'd get any comments. I keep getting, you know, yeah, it's, uh, I'm an old fogey, maybe an old fart in terms of uh, some of my, my uh, musical interests and taste. I loved that little jazzy uh, intro. And uh, somebody mentioned um, Brazilian jazz earlier. For a long time, my favorite song was um, Girl from Ipanema, Stan Getz, the saxophonist. And uh, oh, now I'm having a senior moment. Who was the guy that wrote it? Uh, somebody will tell me in just a minute. Bobby Ocampo, Dr. Richard Bernstein, the father of diabetes self-care, an 80-year-old physician. He was in his 30s and an engineer. His wife was an ER doc. She brought home this seven-pound gadget that helped test blood sugar for ER docs. He was an engineer that had uh, diabetes. He got very curious about that machine, tried to... uh, uh, started collecting data, doing experiments on himself with that glycemia machine, submitted articles to, uh, to, sci- to medical science magazines, and they wouldn't publish his articles because he was an engineer and not a doctor. So he went to medical school and has become a f- basic, huge uh, force for diabetes self-care. In his 80s, he had an HDL in the 90s and a very low LDL. You don't see that among 80-year-old diabetics, unless the 80-year-old diabetic happens to be Dr. Richard Bernstein. His guideline is 4.6 hemoglobin A1c as normal. Yep, he does incredible work. Uh, what's your opinion on grounding and earthing? Um, it sounds really goofy. What I've seen in terms of evidence was also not incredibly convincing. Uh, and in uh, electrical engineering, we use it to make conductive materials to be equipotent with the earth. People are conductive materials. I don't argue with that. And You know, if and when the evidence comes out that shows grounding and earthing to become big issues, I'll be the first to step up and say, yep, I was wrong again. But I'm just not not seeing a lot of evidence in the evidence that I've looked at, a lot of good evidence to support it. E.T. himself, Bobby Ocampo, great question. I bought the materials for grounding myself at a uh, computer in bed, not yet installed. Well, good luck with that, E.T., and if uh, you can generate some good evidence, uh, let us know. About $25. Terry Dixon. Uh, Best is to assume that you're diabetic or at risk. That is very, very true. Just it's much better to assume you're diabetic or pre-diabetic and start with that low-carb diet, even if you're not. It has no risk for health. Very, very limited risk. Uh, Much less risk than not doing it. Bob Sunquist, I would say higher than two thirds. I would agree with you, Bob. I would agree with you. When I asked for a test on MPO, plaque 2, microalbumin to creatinine ratio, and LP little a, my cardiologist doesn't know about this test. Well, Bobby, uh, very few cardiologists do. They don't go there, they don't understand it. They, uh, you know, just like with he's Bobby, by the way, these are these are um, our tests of cardiovascular inflammation. And one of the things that you, you should re- you should go back and ask the doctor yet again, wait a minute. Are you absolutely sure that you don't understand microalbumin to creatinine ratio? Because that is a very, very common test. It's a test for diabetes and uh, kidney injury for diabetes. He probably has seen and even used that, but just didn't connect the dots when you included the other things on cardiovascular inflammation. Myeloperoxidase is MPO, is a test for the enzyme that's made by the polymorphonuclear sites or one of the 
strains of inflammatory sites that are inflama inflammation cells, immune cells that uh, will actually attack plaque in the walls of the arteries. Plaque two is made by another group of immune cells called macrocytes. They also have several other names as well. And uh, again, you can actually test for MPO and plaque two and look at the activity of your own immune system and you taking your arteries taking uh, friendly fire from your immune system because you've got plaque in your artery and your immune system's releasing uh, polymorphs and macrocytes. And those are in turn respectively releasing MPO and plaque too to try to dissolve that plaque. Again, don't expect your cardiologist to go there or be there or be aware or understand it. Doctors may be, uh, may be earned from, well, they may earn from it, but again, they'd have to learn first. Mm -hmm. Learn before you earn. Mabuhai, Bobby, and all but for me is Magandang Hapam. Well, well, or Ruth, I'm impressed with your knowledge of, is it dip? No, that language is not dipologue. Those, somebody remind me what language that is. GLR, I get a lot out of your videos. This one is already proving to be extra pertinent for me. Thank you so much. I expect I'll be reviewing it and sharing it. Well, that is a critical piece. And thank you so much for reminding me. Hey, you know, if you want to help us get this information out and you don't want to make a financial contribution, you can make a big contribution by putting it, number one, just doing a thumbs up, but even more importantly, uh, putting a reference to it on your Facebook channel, your uh if you have a YouTube channel referencing it, uh, put it on your other social media because when eyeballs, when people come back from a competing uh, social media to this, the AI is very interested in that and saying, hey, this is important stuff. It's important enough to pull stuff to make us competitive with the other social media, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. So thank you so much, GLR. Uh, good afternoon, or Ruth. Uh, Bobby, I'm sure your doc knows English. Uh, something but him, Dr. Brewer's book. Oh, give, give him my book. <laughs> thank you, uh, or Ruth. You know, uh, I've had, it's so interesting. I've had a lot of patience for this very reason that, that Aura Ruth and Bobby are talking about giving their doctors my book and uh, good luck on them actually reading it. Your doctor, don't you remember what I described earlier? Most of your doctors are, especially if they're in the U S maybe not yours doc and uh, or Bobby in the Philippines, but clearly the docs in the U S most of them are on that fee-for-service treadmill, trying to get more and more fee-for-service done, cranking up the, the speed on that treadmill, trying to see people faster because the only way they know to get paid is by giving them a script. So do you think they're going to get off of that treadmill and actually read? Doesn't happen very much. It really doesn't. But thank you for the thought. Thank you so much. Bobby Ocampo, I hope Medicare will have therapy on seven day, have a therapy on seven day fasting. I do too. You know, it's so frustrating. They actually expanded a little bit and, and did some stuff with, uh, oh, one of the guys that does plant-based. And I thought that was a little bit of a victory when it happened. But unfortunately, so many plant-based folks are just really high carb and uh, Pritikin, I think. Was it Pritikin that they actually pay for? It'd be so much better if they studied their diets a little bit better. But thanks for the, the thought. GLR, $20. Thank you so much, GLR. Your work is so valuable. Thank you. And thank you again. This will, again, help us get this information out, this content to other folks. ET himself. Doctor's office with about seven to eight uh, doctors changed things around when he had each specialized in two specialties. And in short order, the business became 30% more efficient and more profitable. This was in Ontario. 
specialization makes a difference. Unfortunately, in medicine, we don't have enough folks that have specialized in prevention. That's why everybody's churning stress tests and cardio, coronary artery bypass grafts and taking you to the cath lab for angiograms. Bobby Ocampo, which is better, ARBs or isosorbide dinitrate for hypertension? I'm not that familiar with isosorbide, but it is, it's a, um, unless I'm m mistaken, it's uh, one of the, uh, the nitrates. And the nitrates are helpful. Here's the thing, ARBs and ACEs, especially ACEs, tend to do some things that, uh, that have special protective uh, mechanisms for the kidneys themselves. Um, they also have a multiplicative effect with statins. Remember we talked about statins. You don't need a high dose statin and you're not, we're not worried so much about decreasing LDL. Very few cases do we worry about that or even want to do that. But what you're looking at more often is decreasing cardiovascular inflammation. Well, these medicines, the ARBs, and especially the ACEs, if you can take them, decrease, have a multiplicative effect with uh, statins. And for those of you who've not heard the term, it's called um, pleiotropic. Well, pleiotropic, that's one, another one of those big words. And again, just back off, listen to it, get a different connection on it. Have you ever heard of the Pleiades? Yes, it's a constellation. It's up in the sky and it's the seven sisters. In other words, there's a whole bunch of girls, a whole bunch of sisters. Pleo means a lot or more. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking at pleiotropic mechanisms. So, and, and a pleiotropic mechanism for a drug means a, dr a mechanism that wasn't really planned originally. For statins, it's not so much lowering the LDL, it's decreasing that cardiovascular inflammation, that MPO release, that uh, LPPLA2 release, you know, those enzymes that the immune system releases, the immune cells release when they're attacking that plaque. That's what statins do, and that's what the combination of statins and an uh, ACE inhibitor, and sometimes even an ARB, that's what they do. They decrease that immune activity. That's why they're important. So, Isodil, can Isodil improve your nitric oxide storage? Um, whether or not it improves not, uh, nitric oxide storage, again, uh, these are major components in terms of arterial health, and uh, they're used a lot. Yep. Are you going to get me to say they are better than um, ARBs and especially ACEs? No, I'm not going to say that, but they are helpful. Uh, John Tocho, Dr. Brewer, the OGTT tests in my area say two-step, not three-step. Could you please explain the difference? And if I can only get the two-step, is it still helpful? The two-step is still helpful. So here's what happens. You, what we're doing, we're, we're not looking at a single, a single snapshot. Unfortunately, too many people, and especially academicians, think they know everything. Uh, maybe present company included, but uh, academicians tend to really go for a thing that they called, um, uh, oh gosh, oh, what's that? insulin, uh, that insulin ratio, HOMA IR. Uh, and HOMA IR is a, is a ratio between fasting glucose and the fasting or basal insulin. That may be a little bit better than either of those alone, but the problem is it's a still picture and, and just maybe give you a, an image. We can have a still picture of me standing in front of a bus or a truck and everything looks fine and then turn it into a moving picture, a movie, and we realize that the bus or truck is actually coming at me at about 60 miles an hour and about to run, run over me. We get a whole different perspective when we actually add the extra time period to that. That's exactly what happens with fasting glucose or, fa or basal insulin compared to looking at the glucose tolerance test. So um, <clears throat> a, a two-step is where usually they're, they're referring to getting two numbers. The... Um, the uh, 
the fasting and then the one hour. Uh, a three step is usually referred to as fasting one hour and two hour. That's better. Uh, I tell you what, the, the one hour is the most important because that's the one where we're looking to see just how high does it go. And a healthy number is 120. So, John, I don't know where you live. You can call us. We can uh, we get the more of a full study. We can get even a, a, a four hour study, three and four hour study uh, from some of our groups which are located nationally. They're not, they're located. We can get these everywhere in the United States. So yes, two is better than nothing, but I would challenge you on saying in my area, that's all I can get. If you're in the United States, you can get it. And I've got plenty of uh, patients, for example, in the Philippines that have gotten these as well, as well as Israel, as well as Brazil, as well as England, the UK, um, Singapore, I, again, I challenge that you the the belief that you can't get a better test. Call us, uh, Gilbert. If you'll show Michelle's number, uh, we'll you can call Michelle and we can get you set up. Uh, latest A1C said five point six. Once you start getting a five point six, you're usually you usually have enough insulin resistance to cause plaque. Uh, CGM results would not give you a clue. Yeah, that's. Very, very true. Again, CGM is more of a moving picture. A1C, uh, you know, it's not just me. Thank you, Gilbert, but for putting that number up there. Uh, John, for example, just call and others. If you want to get a better glucose tolerance test, a full insulin, more of an insulin survey, call that number 859-721-1414. And when you're there, ask her about the new Medicare program. Um, so, um, once you get to 5.6, you usually have enough resistance to cause this problem. Um, it's not like, it's not just me that's saying don't depend on A1C or fasting glucose. It's, you know, for those of us who, who care, it's only the, um, the College of Endocrinology and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists that have said and gone on record, I've put it on several slides where they've said A1C is not adequate for diagnosing diabetes or ruling it out. It is not. I'll just make another quick. Well, the reason they say that is there are too many things that impact it. It's, it's impacted by hemoglobin level, which is in impacted in turn by liver disease, kidney disease, uh, genetics, uh, you know, which part of the world you may come from. Um, and what they don't list is very interesting. They don't list what is for me by far the more, the most common reason for seeing a, an A1C that's deceptive. And that is if you're, if you don't eat carbs, if you're on a low carb diet, um, you're very likely to have a low A1C. My A1C, I think this time was, what was it? 5.1, 5.2. It was one of the lower ones that I've had. Um, despite the, back, the fact that I'm fully blown di diabetic and even on this recent uh, OGTT, my glucose, blood glucose went up to what? 190, 195. Terry Dixon, not sure why you keep putting your name down. We've got it. Uh, if you have a question, let us know. Or Ruth. Uh, hi, Doc. Bobby C. is wishing you a beautiful day. That is correct. Oh, thank you. You too, Bobby, and you too as well. Why is GLP-1 going off patent? Or which GLP-1 is going off patent? Uh, didn't we, we mentioned that a couple of times. Liraglutide, not semaglutide, liraglutide or liraglutide. Victoza is what it used to be known as, or it's, it's still known as. It's the brand name. Is there a downside to the oral semaglutide relative to the injectables? Uh, I, yes, there's a significant cost uh, issue there. And I will tell you, if you've ever used, uh, what they do is they just load it down with more and more uh, of the semaglutide to try to get it across the stomach, the acid environment of the stomach. And so you go through that. All of that's to decrease the pain or problem associated with a, an injection. This injection is nothing, folks. If you've ever used a Libre, Freestyle Libre, it's, you know, it's like a little pin. It's like a little uh, filament that goes into your arm, which you don't feel. This is, this is the same gauge. It's like a 32 gauge. And 
It's a third of the length. I mean, this is not, uh, don't be a wimp about that, about that injection. So Tamara spills, n n and uh, pardon me for using that term. I do have people, I've got some patients that prefer the ribelsis, and yes, I give it to them. So anything to, uh, to help, but it's not a big deal. Uh, before you decide to go the ribelsis route, if you're going to do one of these, um, actually take a look at the, at the semaglutide or, or one of the injectables. Tamara spillus, mnemonic, stomach growling, growling, hungry indicator. Yep, uh, the hunger hormone. Thank you so much, Tamara. Kurt Bryant, is there any evidence that exogenous ketones affecting your hunger hormone? Yes, there definitely is. Um, plenty of people say, um, and there is uh, plenty of evidence that, uh, that exogenous ketones help. How strong is that evidence? Yeah, that's the problem. The people that sell those exogenous ketones say the evidence is just fantastic and really, really good. I don't sell exogenous ketones. And I would say mm, there's evidence. Is it incredibly strong? It's not as incredibly strong as the people that are selling it would say. So Shark Air, I'll have to watch this again later. Great info. Thank you so much, Shark Air. ET himself, is oral melatonin a reasonable idea for a good sleep? Uh, just like anything else, there's debate on that. I tried it a few times, never got much impact myself. And um, uh, some people do, though. Uh, I do want to stop and make a comment. Uh, LG, LPG 1233 8 one, two, three, three, eight, ninety nine dollars uh, a super chat. Thank you so much, LPG one, two, three, three, eight. Again, this these kind of contributions make it make a big, big difference in terms of our ability to get this information out there. Uh, what is your opinion your opinion on Indocalyx Pro? It looks like a promising supplement. You know, LPG, I am very interested. I haven't heard of it. Endocalyx Pro. As you see, I'm writing it down to take a look. We will see. You know, as uh, there are a lot of supplements that are uh, that promise to make a huge impact on the glycocalyx. Um, the problem is, again, you know, how much do they help? Let me just take a look. Tired looking for name, $20. Thank you so much, Tired looking for a name. Again, these, uh, these super chats make a big difference. Dear Dr. Brewer, do you have any opinion on MitoQ, mitoquinone, variation of ubiquinone supplement? Is it worth the money? It is substantially more expensive than ubiquinone. Well, thanks, Tired. And here's the point, or here's what I know. Ubiquinone costs a lot more far more than twice as much as uh, just plain old CoQ10. Well, um, it's the, the reason they, they say that it's better is that it's more bioavailable. Is it more bioavailable? The evidence would indicate that it is. Is it more than twice as bioavailable? In other words, once you... Um, start putting the money into the equation of cost versus benefit. No, it's not more than twice as bioavailable. So I don't recommend that my folks go to the extra expense of getting ubiquinone. Am I familiar with mitoquinone? No, I'm not. I haven't seen, seen that yet. I'm sure the mitoquinone uh, folks selling it would tell you it's far better and very, very much worth the money. I will tell you, you know, again, <clears throat> I do approach the entire CoQ10 uh, space with a little bit of um, concern in terms of uh, evidence. And here, I, I, yes, I do. I, I tell people, if you're taking a statin, uh, take CoQ10. And I take a statin and I do take CoQ10. But here's the thing. The CoQ10, the mitoquinone, the ubiquinone, all of those are to help the mitochondria. That's why you see that brand name taking, you know, the first two syllables out of mitochondria. 
What's the evidence that any of these actually help the mitochondria? Well, there's a lot of really good logic behind it, but hard evidence? Mm -mm. I've, uh, I've done the videos on that. And here's the thing. How are you going to actually get that much hard evidence that a supplement is actually improving the energy production by mitochondria? I can tell you, as the golfers say, that's a mighty long putt. There's too much green in between the ball where it is right now and the hole. So I will, let, let me just write it down, though. Mitoquinone. I'll see if I can take a look at those. Thank you so much, guys, for the, uh, for the contribution. Uh, mezzanine. I'm in that vicious sleep cycle, and it's awful. Oh, I tell you what. I, you know, I, as I've shared with folks, I've started thinking that, that Ozempic, if it had absolutely no impact on weight or um, cardiovascular stuff, risk, I would still take it knowing what I know now because sleep has been such, it's, it's been, and for me and for many people with uh, prediabetes, diabetes, it's such a problem. And I don't understand why there's not a lot more discussion about sleep and the glip points. I just, I don't get it. Thank you so much, Mezzanine, for bringing that up. Bobby Ocampo, Dr. Roger Sayholt, yep, recommends near-infrared from the sun to have a good sleep. Ah, uh, E.T., great idea. I forgot. John Tucho, let's see how many, oh gosh, folks, we've got, ooh, We've got more than I can respond to. I'll tell you that. I'll get through a few more if I can. Um, and then we'll have to leave in just a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, John Tucci, I wish you could get these meds for diabetes resistance, especially at age 65. You know where you are headed. That's the truth. You know, and here's the place. Uh, you bring up a point. And I, as I mentioned before, so many of us love to hate on Big Pharma. Big Pharma makes untold amounts of money. But now here's where the problem is in my mind. There are some drugs that would have a huge positive impact and save tons of lives. I cannot believe that it costs big pharma as much now to make these drugs as they're, as they're charging for them. I also can't believe, well, so Big Pharma would come back and say, well, um, we have to pay for all that research and development. That is very true. You know, and in fact, my whole life, I have not been a Big Pharma critic. I'm on, you know, it's like a balanced approach. I'm still not a Big Pharma clinic and uh, or critic and not a huge one anyway. But it doesn't mean that I think they're perfect. I think right now what is happening is the, the Big Pharma is letting a whole lot of people die because, and have these problems because they want to make more money. And if that's not a criticism, I don't know what is. Bobby Ocampo, any comparison with SGLT2 inhibitors and glip ones? Yes, which is better value for the money? Well, the SGLT2s are about three quarters of the price. They're a totally different, uh, they have a totally different mechanism. What they do is, here's what happens with glucose in the kidney. They work on the kidneys. And here's what happens with glucose in the kidney. It will, it, once it gets past a certain level, it, your filter, the glomeruli, will start spilling that, that glucose into the urine. Now, there are things called collecting tubules beyond this uh, glomerulus that spill the filter that's spilling it into the urine. Those collecting tubules will actually pull that glucose back. And SGLT2 stands for sodium glucose... Uh, I can't remember what the LT, but the glucose uh, reuptake, it paralyzes or it slows down that glucose reuptake. So what happens is any glucose that you spill actually goes in the urine and stays there. It doesn't get pulled back in. So that sounds like a very elegant, great mechanism. And it's true. Um, what's the problem? Well, any, any of these drugs have problems, and I'll go over the problems with both of them in just a second. But back to your point, 
Uh, SGLT2s, um, they have some weight loss, but not nearly as much. Both of these drugs, and they're coming out with major, the SGLT2s as well are coming out with major CVOT, cardiovascular outcome trials, uh, results that are fantastic. So that's, you know, I only covered a portion of the frontiers in medications for diabetes today. I didn't cover the SGLT2s, and they're a big deal. They're not quite as big as, as the GLP ones for uh, two reasons. Number one, not quite as big of an impact on cardiovascular outcome trials. And number two, that's understandable because they don't have quite as much of an impact on weight loss. So, but really good medications, less expensive. Uh, for those of you who haven't or not, who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Farziga is, or Farziga is the one I tend to use, and there are several others out there as well. Harvey Ops, don't forget to like or thumbs up. Thank you so much, Harvey. I do appreciate that. And again, if uh, as Harvey has said, do a like or thumbs up. It's totally free, and it still helps people get access to this content. The other thing, again, if you'll put it on, um, put it on uh, your uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter account, pull eyeballs back to this. Again, it'll help get that information out there without costing you a penny. Thank you so much. I got to get go get ready to see some patients, and we will see you a little bit later. Thank you for your interest. Oh.